Actually facing the other way, it was, it was rotated around. Yeah. Well, if that's true, mm -hmm. then um, this will work now. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> you know, I should have caught that. I should have caught that. So I guess when we look at that later, we'll see an eye go in there. Yeah. <laughs> you know, you learn to laugh at yourself. <laughs> Peace 
So I apologize for that, but understanding I'm just a stand-in, so I don't do so good. Um, looking forward to her soon return. We started at day six, and she said it's day six. I said, you sure it's not day 11 or 12? She said, no, it's day six. So I said, six, eh? And so we started at that day, and then every day I've said, good morning, five, Good morning for, you know, so we're, we're on the countdown. And um, I am looking forward to her return. And I think uh, she is also looking very forward to being back. So that's always a good sign. It's when they go away and they don't look forward to returning, you have to worry. So, amen, she, she'll be back soon. All right, Judges chapter 12, we're in Judges chapter 12. Uh, we had finished up... Uh, uh, Verse 2, we talked about how Jephthah had said that he had cried out to them in their time of great strife and, and they delivered not. They didn't pay any attention. And we talked about that being grief of, 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 of a real need that he was expressing. Um, and so we move into 3 and he goes on to say, And when I saw that ye delivered me not, I put my, hand, my life in my hands and passed over against the children of Ammon. And the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then are you come up unto me this day to fight against me? Pretty good argument if you ask me. They didn't help him, so when he tried to help himself, when he tried to do what God was leading him to do, now they get mad and they want to, they want to fight him and threaten his life. So we start off with, he says, and I saw, when I saw, he was not blind, he's telling them this. You know, it's very plain to me, when I saw that you delivered me, not, uh, did the, you delivered me not, when I cried for help, uh, when, I, when I saw that you were deaf to my voice and blind to my situation, it was then I decided to act, to put my life in my own hands and trust my own judgment. Um, there is some application of this in life, is there not? Somebody tell me what it is, what it's been for your life. Has there ever been a time you cried out to God and you, you really feel like he didn't hear you? You know, you, you, you're like, your heart is heavy, you cry out and you, you're like, you didn't deliver me, God. You look at me funny. God doesn't always deliver us. Sometimes, and, and I might want to add, and I'll stand to be corrected if you won't, uh, God doesn't want to deliver us, he wants us to go through Deliverance avoids the problem. It avoids uh, what he's trying to teach us. But when we go through, it teaches us some things. What are some of those things it teaches us? Trusting him. Mm -hmm. Patience, trusting him. Long suffering. Long suffering. Faith. You know, sometimes things don't... Well, let me rephrase that one too. A lot of times things don't come out like I'd like them to come out. But you know, it's really not what I want. Mm -hmm. It's what God desires to accomplish in my life. Um, but he says, I was not blind. He said, I cried for help and, and I seen you were, you were deaf to my voice, blind to my situation. Is God ever deaf? Is he ever blind? Does he ever ignore you? You've got to keep that in mind. When it seems like he is, he's not. And you have to ask, Okay, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? And we talked about this this morning um, with a few. Uh, his words, basically, when you look at what Jeff was saying, he said, I considered and I perceived. I considered what you, how you were acting. I perceived that your actions were. Um, he's, he's just basically telling them, he said, I've been watching you. I've been watching your actions, and I've been observing your demeanor toward me, and I, I don't see that you're going to help. Uh, the idea of being pushed by that is, the idea is, is depth of sight. He thought on what was going on. He, meditation, if you would. Um, 
I was thinking about that, and I said, the truth is, you can't wait on people forever. Uh, don't apply that with God. God's time is not our time. And, and you may really desire some things, you may really pray for some things, and, and, and say, well, you know, I, go, I know God's going to give this to me. You may never get it. I, I, I was in here one time, and I was teaching, and I made a statement about the most important thing for God. Does anybody remember what I said? Our relationships. Exactly. He doesn't care about your health. He doesn't care about your wealth. Those are things he has. He can give to you or take from you. And he does that in order to get you to have a relationship with him. And so you have to keep that in mind. Um, but you can't wait on people ever, forever. But you have to trust that when you act, you're acting in the time of God. Um, when I look at this... Uh, I'm, I'm drawn to a thought, and this is, this is a, a, a place that many struggle sometimes. Um, the thought is, you have to make a decision. You're, you're required to make a decision. You're required to act. Jephthah is brought to a place where he has to make a decision. That's a, he's in a tough position if you think about the decision he has to make. And I think we're all put in those positions at times. Okay, it's time to act. And I, I talk with people a lot of times, and um, they say, what if it's a wrong decision? Okay, what do you do if you make a decision and it's the wrong decision? Depends if you can repent and turn away from it, but if the decision already made and you can't, then you move forward and seek the Lord from there on. <laughs> well, you're hitting right on it. The, the, the problem is not making a wrong decision. We make them all the time. Okay? We say things we don't want to say. We think things we don't want to think. We always are making wrong decisions. We go left. As the, as the fellow once told me, he said, I zigged when I should have zagged. <laughs> and we do this. We make them all the time. The problem is not making the wrong decisions. The problem is how you respond once you make that decision. And I think you're right. If it's a decision that takes you away from God, you have to repent and get back. Um, I had left a ministry one time to go and, and, and be involved in another ministry. And the, uh, I was really struggling. I was having a very difficult time. And so I called the, the head man over the, the one ministry, and I talked with him a little while. He said, you need to repent and go back to the last place you were in the will of God. I said, hmm, that's interesting. So I, I thought about it. I'm a thinker, okay? So I, I, I thought about that for a while. I called him up. I said, you're wrong. He said, how can you tell me that? I said, because you're speaking in the physical, not the spiritual. No, uh, I've told you this before. No place stays the same. It's constant change in our world. So I can't go back and be in the exact place I was there. But I can get right with God and be right where I was before I sinned, before I departed. Will God take me back to that place? I can't answer that. It's different. It depends on God's will for your life. But I know uh, it's not the physical place. It's the spiritual place when we're talking about God. And so you repent and get right. And then you just hold your hands up and say, Lord, this, my life is yours. What do you want to do now? I've made a mistake. I'm repenting from that. Where do you want me to go from here? He may tell you, stay. Stay here. Or he may say, go there or go there. I don't know. But the, the deal is, it's, it's, you're, going to make a, you're going to make a mistake. That's a no-brainer. The problem is how you're going to deal with it afterward. And it's always, 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 Repentance with God. Get right with him and say, now where will you lead me? Um, I, I say this often enough. Uh, decisions, um, you have to be careful. Some decisions that don't look to be very important can really have a big effect on your life down the road. There was a, an evangelist I knew. He was a um, in the Air Force. He was a sharpshooter. He shot a lot of competitions with a pistol he was a champion shooter and he always preached because he turned into an evangelist he always preached about attitude right attitude he said attitude is when you fire off a rocket he says and it goes he says and if you're a half inch or quarter inch or 16th inch on earth he said where will you be by the time you hit the moon it magnifies as it goes further he says the same with shooting targets. He said there is no variance. You're dead on. 
He said, because if you're a sixteenth off here, when you get 50 to 100 feet down the range, he said, you're off. He said, you can't win a match that way. Well, is that not the same in our lives? And, and attitude is a pretty good word for it. What is your attitude? Well, it's okay, you know, it's, it's just a little. Is it that little? Where will that decision take you in a year, five years, or ten years? Where do most alcoholics start at? Social drinking. Well, you know, they asked me to. I don't really drink, but I'll take a drink. The more you're involved in that, the longer you stay in that. Alcoholics didn't, didn't, didn't intend to become alcoholics. Drug addicts didn't intend to become drug addicts. We don't intend to end up where we end up. But we allow little things in our life that draw us away. The decisions, no matter how little they are, can have a pretty big impact. And so when you make them, you need to be sure and spend time with God and search out your heart. To be sure first there's no sin. To be sure that you're not allowing yourself to, to say, okay, well, this is the will of God. Boy, have I done that. I want to do something so bad. You say, well, I know God would have me do this. Have you ever done that? Or am I the only one? Yeah, well, thank you. I appreciate that. Um, when you laugh, I know I'm not in this boat alone. Um, so it's very important for the lines of communication to be open. Uh, and uh, I'm sorry, my, I'm wanting to um, ramble a little bit, but I was thinking about um, nothing between my soul and my Savior. How important is that? Tremendous. Um, when we, we talk about the, the uh, praying and making these decisions, what do you think is the most important part of making any decision? I want your thoughts on that. Waiting on the Lord. Anybody else? Pray and study. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not really going exactly in the direction. You had something else? Yes, I also ask God to give me some of his godly wisdom so I can make wise choices. Mm -hmm. I, I, you're, you're, you're not saying the exact word, but you're all... Uh, are, well, no, you're, you're, you're saying what it is. But you're not really saying the word I'm looking for, communication. Which you're, you all basically said, you're communicating to God. And, and that's, that's important, communication. And we talked about making sure your, your life, you don't have any sin, you're not biased. You're, you you kind of try to remove yourself out of it. You have to remove yourself uh, the best you can. You have to be sure that you're as right with God as you can. Because if you don't, the lines of communication aren't open. The further you are away from something, the harder it is to hear. Unless you have a cellular phone, and then it depends on your location. But you do understand what I'm saying. Um, my, my wife is now 3,000 miles away, and we do text. And when I text her, sometimes I watch. <laughs> and then I see it go, ding. <laughs> and then I sit there, and I may text again, may text twice, and, and nothing's happening. And all of a sudden, ding. And then mine go, ding, 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 you know, because of the delay. The more we keep in between God and us, the more delay there's going to be. As a matter of fact, we can shut off that communication. Uh, not that he would uh, not try to communicate, but we stop our ears. We allow all these things. Um, I don't know. Um, I think I've, I've spoken about this before when God called uh, and was moving me to go to, to the college. He was calling me into the ministry, but this was part where he was leaving. I was supposed to be leaving the church and going in, into the uh, college for, for training. Um, everybody was shouting. Everybody was telling me what God's will is. Can you tell me what God's will is for my life? Can I tell you? But yet everybody around was wanting to tell me. Who needed to tell me? God. And so you have to get away from that. You have to back off. And you just have to give God a chance to speak. And I think that's, again, this is all in what we're talking about. You want to make sure the lines are, are open. You want to make sure there's nothing between you and him. You want to be sure that when he speaks, that he's plain to hear, and nothing hinders your prayer to him. Um, Let me try, uh, and I know I'm hitting the same thing 
the same way, but let me, let me give another thought in here. When we are not right with God, when we have allowed things to, to get in between us, to hinder our relationship, to hinder our prayer life, to hinder his ability to answer us in a way that he would choose to answer us, uh, his blessings, if you would. Um, there is something that we have done, and I've been thinking about this as I, I studied through this, that I don't think we realize that we've done. And uh, I think when we do this, and he says, I put my life in my hands. Um, uh, I'm going to go a little different way. I think in essence, when we, when we don't uh, keep our relationship right with God, I think in essence what we do, we lay down our shield and protector. We step away from that shield. God's there if we're in that right relationship to shield us from all these things. If we're in that right relationship, God's wanting to protect us from all these things. But I think when we lay that down, the doors begin to open. The fence around us begin to have cracks in it because he has allowed things in to get us attention, to get us back to where we're supposed to be. And so if he's our, our shield and defender, he's our first line of defense, when we uh, begin to drift from him, we basically put our lives, like Jeff says, in our own hands. Who would you rather be in? Whose hands would you rather be in? I would much rather be in God's. Sometimes it's not the most enjoyable because of things he allows, but in truth, um, he's working in my life. He's doing things. So when Jephthah says, I put my life in my hands, he's in essence in telling them, he says, I'm not going to trust you. I'll trust in my own ability. I'll trust in how God is leading me. I think... Um, uh, he was going, in my opinion, he was going to trust in God's direction. And he, he was now making the decision, I'm going to act on it. Um, his steps was he had appealed. Uh, they had not really listened or he didn't think they listened because he didn't get a reply. Um, and so uh, he acted on his faith in relationship to God. And again, that's important, uh, that relationship uh, to God. Um, you know, there's so much in Scripture... We, here, I think we're missing, because I think what we're doing, we're getting the general, we're getting the little crib notes. We're getting it real quick. We don't see the, the interpersonal relationship with him and God. We don't see how he may have labored in prayer. We don't see, you understand? There's a lot we don't see. We see the generality of it. And so when I look at this, I'm looking and thinking, how did he get here? What, what is it that, that moves into this? And what am I seeing? And so I'm thinking about this. Um, do you think Jephthah was afraid? Human nature would be to be. <laughs> he did make a vow in the first one, didn't he? And so if he made a vow in the first one, that was an indication there was some fear, some uncertainty. So yeah, I think he's afraid. I think he may be a little more secure now, but I don't think he's lost any of his knowledge of, of what war does. The outcome of war is very unpredictable. Um, just like you said, I think any man going to war would, would should be afraid. If they're not, then I would. I don't want to be around them. Let's put it this way. I'd, I'd be a little curious about that. Um, when I look at this situation, um, to be honest, I see another exercise of his faith. His first was with his daughter. Well, actually, I would say the first one would have been going to war and he vowed the vow. Then the second one would have been with his daughter. Now, all of a sudden, he's got this. This is the third. You ever feel like things hit you like that? Boom, boom, boom. And maybe they don't stop. Boom, 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 boom. They keep going. Um, and you're like, why is all this happening to me? Well, sometimes it could be we may have failed the test and now we're having to re-go through it. Sometimes it could be God says, I found you faithful in this. Let me get you a little... More. Let's, let's go a little further. Let me continue growing you and strengthening you. And I do think these are exercises that strengthen us. I think they strengthen us, uh, our faith. I think they strengthen our relationship with God when we handle them correctly. Um, but in this situation, I think it may have done something else too. These men are watching their leader go through some things. He went to war with them. He fought with them. Now he made that vow, his daughter was involved, now he's having to deal with his own people. I think, for me, watching somebody that's leading me going through these, I, I, could, um, I could follow that person, I think. I could, I could really uh, 
uh, trust him and, and go with him if he's making the right uh, decisions. Uh, what about for God? We talk about how these things affect us. And I've talked about just then about how they may have affected those that are watching him. How about God? How would this reflect, reflect on his relationship with God? Trust again. If God uh, places you in a situation and you fail to handle it in the aspect or in the way that he wants you to handle it, what is your outlook on that? What's going to happen for you? Depends on where you walk with the Lord. If you if you to trust Him, even when things don't go as you expect, if, or He doesn't answer. You if you didn't, if you failed that, you didn't trust Him. That's the whole point. So, what happens to I, your I see, I see. what happens to your relationship? To do what He wanted us to do. Yeah. And so it does, it damages that relationship. What I'm driving at is the more we are able to, to, to trust the Lord, the more we'll go through these things. And I, I use the term, we, became, we become a favored instrument. When God wants to do something, and it fits in our, he would look to us to, to, to accomplish those things. And the, I think our faith is rewarded by God using us in the lives of people. And I think that's what we want to do as Christians. I want to be used in your life, you know, and, and positively. And, and I want God to use what he's doing in your life and my life. I think that is uh, like reciprocal growth. What we encourage each other to walk in the Lord and, and to grow and be stronger. I think that's all part of it. I'm no better than you and you're no better than me. And we watch each other walk. And as we walk, we strengthen each other in that walk. And as we grow all grow closer to God, we grow stronger as a church in unity and love and the ability to serve Him. And I think that's very important that we do that. And so that's where I was going with that, uh, the idea there, to become a favorite instrument, to, to, be, to, be, to desire to be used of God in the lives of people, that we might see more people come to know Him, that we might see those that, come to, that have accepted Christ become stronger Christians because of our impact in their lives, and because of that, their impact in our lives, we become stronger. Um, so how do we get to there? How we come that instrument that God wants to use? Isn't that really the question here? How do we get there? Humble yourself to the potter's hand. Now I want, that, that, that's a good scripture. Now I want practical. The practical application of kneeling, of humbling yourself is what? Repenting when you aren't. Good spiritual answer. I want the practical. Be willing to be used by God. Be willing to use. Now let's get more practical. How? That's true. I'm, 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 and all, all these are good, but I'm submitting. Submit. Okay. When we, when we, and a lot of you weren't here for this. I know Monica was. Um, I, I said one time, I said, and I, I'll probably mention it uh, somewhere down in these. It's in these notes somewhere. I said, when people come in here, show yourself friendly. I said, if somebody comes in here and they can't find the the page number on the. Um, Book, give them your psalm book and take theirs and find the page. Practical application. Do what you know you can do now. Serve in whatever capacity. I used to teach youth in churches when the pastors would ask me. And they said, what is the will of God for my life? The first thing you have to understand is the basic will. The general will for God for every person is to have a personal relationship with God. That is foremost. Be in your Bible. Be reading. Have that relationship. Second, the second thing you have to do is be willing to serve God in any capacity he says. And I would tell them, they said, well, I can't preach, I can't do this. I said, that's not what God's called you to do at this point. But when you walk in the door of that church, if there's a piece of paper on the floor, you should pick it up. Amen. That simple. 
whether it be a page number, picking up trash, what you see to do is service because God has revealed that to you. That's the application. That's the practical part. If you're not willing to do now the little things, you're not going to be faithful in the big. And that is the little things, by the way. You see a brother or sister struggling? Just a word of you know, encouragement? You understand what I'm saying? And what does that do for the church? Builds them up. It promotes brotherly love. It promotes that unity. It promotes that care and that compassion one for another. And is that not what this is all about? You walk out that door into that world, there is no care for you, for your faith, for what you believe, or God, or anything else. When we come here, we call this a sanctuary. And that's exactly what it ought to be. A sanctuary from the things that happen out there. I firmly believe that. And I think we ought to practice it. When you look at what's going on in his life, his only sanctuary was God. That's it. That's all he had. Everything else. You know, if you look at, at uh, he fought with the children of Ammon, and, and he had, had to give up uh, his daughter, and, and he's just struggling with this thing. Now his own brethren come to him, and I can just see him go to God and fall on his knees and hold up his hands and say, Oh, Lord, what am I going to do? I can see the burden of his heart here. Look at three, he says, I put my life in my hands. I passed over against the children of Ammon, and the Lord delivered them into my hand. Wherefore then, because all this has happened, why now are you come up against me, or come up unto me this day to fight against me? Why am I having to fight my own brother? Um, You know, if we're waiting on God to call us, we need to just get, uh, get about the, uh, what we see to do and just trust him in his name. Carry his name in any way you can. Um, I think sometimes people have, uh, people prejudge others and they say, well, you know, God can never use him. Don't fall into that trap. There's nobody on the face of the earth that they won't surrender themselves to God that he can't use. Um, let me um, I think I've missed a printing on here one second oh yeah I, I missed something here Um, I was going to go into an illustration, and, and I guess what I did, I rewrote some things this morning and didn't um, print them off. But let me let me just uh, try to remember. Um, you know, we're, we're talking about God using us. We're talking about situations and things. And, and I'm sorry, I've lost a lot of thoughts in here because I, I didn't run off the other piece of paper, but... Let's go to the life of Joseph, Joseph real quick. What do you know about Joseph? Somebody tell me something about Joseph. He trusted God even when his brothers sold him into slavery. Okay. He served him no matter what. What caused him to be sold into slavery? Jealousy. Jealousy. Because um, his father looked on him as a favorite child in a way. And he was sold into slavery. Now, when you're sold into slavery, that means you lose all rights, correct? Am I correct? So wouldn't he have a right to be bitter? Wouldn't he have a right to consider God had forsaken him? Wouldn't he have a right to consider that God has not delivered me and done what I think is fair in my life? Yeah. And I think a, a lot of people would react that way. So when he was soul, um, what, ha what happened to him? I want you to think of... He remained faithful to God. Yeah, but what happened to him? Where did he go from the time he was soul? He ended up in Egypt. Okay, he ended up in Egypt, uh, Potiphar's house. Uh, he ended up being a slave in there. Uh, probably not a bad position. Uh, he ended up with some authority. Could a man who had, uh, after being sold into slavery, and, and kind of feel like he had the right to be bitter, if he'd have had that kind of attitude, would you think he'd have ended up in that position? So 
I surmise, and this is a guess, but I surmise that Joseph did not have a bad attitude. We accepted what God allowed, and God blessed him. Well, then something else happens. What? False accusations. So now he's thrown into prison. In this prison, he's also given authority. And in prisons, when you when you begin to be trusted, you're called trustees, right? Now, what do you think life was like in prison for him? Pretty good, because he's a trustee. He's getting to handle everything. Yeah. Well, prison's just taking away freedom. It could be worse. How do you think he was treated in that prison? As a trustee. I want you to think with me for a minute. There's a reason I'm doing this. I think that people in the prison probably respected him because of his attitude. Mm-hmm. That's a good observation. And his skills. Huh? They, they respected his skills. He was, yes. But how was he treated? He had respect, but how was he treated? Let me, let, me, let me put this to you. I was thinking this morning about all this, and I was thinking about his condition, the attitudes and everything. When he was brought before Pharaoh, they make three statements that tells you how he looked. He was cleaned. He was shaven. And then he was dressed. So it tells me he could have been looking very ragged. It was prison. It doesn't mean they're going to dress you nice and really, even though they, they say they trust you. We say respect, but it was like, I trust you to do. You know, and maybe the jailer had a little more respect for him. But there was a, a level of trust, but he's still a prisoner. They still treated him as such. And when I look at this, maybe I'm wrong, but when they had to shave him and clean him and dress him, to bring him before Pharaoh, I'm thinking, he may have been in pretty rough shape. He may not have eaten very well there. But what do we know? He still loved God. He still handled the situation exactly as if he had been blessed of God. And that's important for us to catch that. All through all this, he kept his testimony. When I look at this and, and, and I see uh, in Jephthah, um, I see a man who's, who's struggling, but I see a man who's kept his testimony. And we'll get into more of that. Um, I just brought all that down to say this. God allows events to try us, to prove us uh, for the ministry, for his use. And the more we're able to depend on him, the more we learn to trust him, the greater responsibility um, we can enjoy. And I say enjoy um, because that responsibility there's, and I don't know if I've ever said this. There's two things that are primary to our lives for God. One of them is the glory of God and the other is the souls of men. You know, those are the two things that are primary. To see people come to know Jesus Christ that we might glorify God with our lives and in ministering for him. Um, and so that's all part of that instrument. That's all part of being favored. But that he might use us to reach others. So I, I see um, that he allows these things to, to bring us to that position. I think Joseph is a glowing example of what we should seek to be, no matter what happens in our lives. Um, what we're doing while we're waiting on him, are we really looking to, to serve him in any capacity? Are we willing to serve him? And, and I'll say again, in any capacity, no matter whether we're rich or poor, whether uh, we're struggling, or whether we're blessed beyond comparison. Uh, it doesn't matter. Um, uh, anything else before I go on to the next verse? I don't have but a few minutes, but if you have anything to add or anything, I'm going I'm to I'm leave that there at this point. Uh, I, I will say this. Um, these Ephraimites, um, they didn't minister to the, men, to the need of the men of Gilead, did they? When in their time of need, they didn't come. Ephraim was only concerned about what they wanted and what they thought was right. What happened? They ended up getting in a fight over it. Um, so, verse 4 says, Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim, and the men of Gilead smote Ephraim, because they said, and I find this, this very interesting, 
um, because they said, Ye Gilonites are fugitives of Ephraim, among the Ephraimites and among Manassas, uh, Manassites. Um, uh, I'm going to draw our attention to first verse 1 in chapter 12. And it said, The men of Ephraim gathered themselves together. I want to um, uh, peg that word gathered. And then we go to verse 4, and it says, Then Jephthah gathered. Again, that word gathered. Two different words. Totally two different words. Um, the first one gives you the idea that the men of Ephraim were summoned um, to gather together. Um, uh, they came for a fight. They, Mama always used to say, You're cruising for bruising. You know, and that's what they come for. Um, there's another term she used to spoiling for a fight or spoiling for a whooping. Um, so we, we also find um, Jephthah gathering his people together for a fight. Uh, the first word used in verse 1 by Ephraim seems to be a more emotional type word. It's, it carries the idea of clamor, um, noisy shouting, a loud continuous noise. An insistent public expression of um, like a support or protest or whatever. Uh, this, this in, in, in this would be in my opinion, was, is a manner or was a manner in which certain people could influence um, a public uh, opinion and direction. You get all these riots, you get all these protests. That's what that's for, to influence public opinion and direction. And um, uh, so I get the idea from verse... Verse 1, that word used there, that these people were not of one mind. Will you follow my thinking on that? So they start all this clamor, they start all this protesting, they're running their mouths, they're, they're, they're just agitating the crowd. And so they're, they're, they're raising emotions because they want to push the opinion and push the direction of these people. So I don't think they're, they're of one mind. There was a need um, uh, to, to stir up to go against Jephthah. I think some of those people didn't have a problem with what Jephthah done. Well, I think there was people in there that uh, it did affect them. And so they're stirring this thing up. Now, I'm out of time, so you have to wait till next Sunday for the other gather. So anyway, any questions, anything you want to add before we close? All right, then. We are dismissed, and we'll be back on the hour. <laughs>